Today, uh, we're going to continue uh, with looking at some results from Maxwell's wave equation. So, those of you who haven't taken 320, there's going to be a bit of a gap here, but I, I'm going to ground you on some of the elements or results from Maxwell's wave equation. So, but what we're moving towards is following the polarization of light. And maybe it's worth discussing for a few minutes, where do we see polarization in everyday life? Does so anyone have any examples of where polarization comes about in, in things we might use or how we see the world? Sorry, go ahead. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, 3D movies. So, some, some of these systems use polarized light where you might let this polarization on this eye and this polarization and the two screens of information give you the depth information. So that's a more complicated one. Okay, another one said the sky. The blue sky is polarized. Okay, the, the, scat the scattering of light, Rayleigh scattering, has a polarization difference. And so when you put polarization, uh, a polarizer up, you will see the sky go very blue or not so blue. Yes? Which type? Um, well, that's a polarizer on a camera lens, so that's, ex that's similar to the example. That's right. Um, all of you look into displays today. Right, and they have liquid crystals, and so quite often there's polarizers like this which block the light, and when you activate the liquid crystal, there's different versions, but it rotates the polarization of light, so it, it lets the light pass or not pass, so it's electrically modulated polarization control to pass the light through, through the device. Um, and then good, good quality shades, um, sunglasses will have polarizers on, or and, on them, and when we look at um, for now reflections off of surfaces, it, it turns out that at grazing angles, there's one polarization which has a higher re reflectance than another. And the glare then is, has a preferred polarization. And when you line up a polarizer, it takes away a lot of the glare. So if you turn your sunglasses this way, if you fall over, so things are more glary. It's a more dangerous way to drive. And this way, it's much, much clearer, OK? <laughs> All right, so, so that's some motivation in where we see polarization. And we have a quantitative method of, of following polarization. It, it's it's going to have a lot of geometry in it, so I have a lot of terms to define. So you're going to have to sort of freshen up your mind, pay attention to the details. So I'll explain why we need all these parameters in place. So it gets somewhat fussy. Now that's going to be after I introduce two more concepts. So I want to finish two things first. I want to talk about the impedance of space and the pointing vector. These are results from Maxwell's wave equation. So I have maybe five or eight minutes here before we launch into polarization. OK, so one of the results of Maxwell's um, wave equations is that if we take k hat, so what is k hat? Well, this is just the direction of the light propagation. It's k over the magnitude of k. So it tells us the direction of propagation. And if I cross that with the instantaneous value of electric field, it points in the direction of the magnetic field. And the ratios of the magnetic field, sorry, that should be the curved version, um, instantaneous value. And it has a ratio that goes usually as mu naught over epsilon in the optical domain. This is in the optical domain. So what this means is inside a material, we usually have um, mu equal to mu r equals, uh, sorry, times mu naught. And usually, mu r equals 1 in the optical domain. There are very few materials that are magnetically active. So basically, most materials have mu naught present. So I just write that in there as shown. However, the electric response, the dielectric constant, will change a lot because it's easy to push electrons around the atoms in all solids or even in air. So they do respond to electric field. It's hard to turn currents on with the very fast oscillation frequency. So that's why the magnetic responses are low. 
So epsilon, the permittivity then, whoops, has a relative value times epsilon naught, and epsilon r is not equal to uh, one except in vacuum. So we've seen these ideas before. Um, so this is the permeability. And this is the permittivity. Okay. And, um, and I want to then talk about epsilon r. So epsilon r turns out to be equal to the refractive index squared. So in the optical domain, we tend not to think of how capacitors respond. We like to use refractive index more frequently, all right? And mu of r in the optical domain is usually equal to 1. Okay, so then you can, in fact, use refractive index to consider these relationships in, in various circumstances. So the first thing I want to do is go and define the permittivity, or sorry, the impedance. And in vacuum, the impedance is equal to mu naught over epsilon naught. So if I just take these magnetic and dielectric quantities, which you know um, from previous courses, um, this is 377 ohms. So this is the impedance of free space And it's useful um, here. It, it actually has a, a really interesting way of us to kind of get rid of following both E and H. Yes? Is that like a Korean? That's Neda. Um, it's a Greek symbol. So it's like N in the Greek, Greek um, symbols. Yes? Uh, since E cross H is equal to K, isn't K cross E equal to negative H? Oh, sorry. Uh, what did you want to say? No, it should be positive. Let me just, um, do I have an error? Let's see. I, could I have it backwards? I could have an error here. Um, let me just check again. E cross H should point in K. Um, I didn't think about this. Did I copy an error from somewhere else? So if I do K cross E, it looks right. Yep. I think I'm right. All right. Um, so this turns out to be helpful. Um, in the following sense that this has magnitude 1, right? This has magnitude. Is there a question over there? Do you have a question? OK. Um, so this has magnitude 1, then I can just look at E and H, and this is kind of like circuit analysis in free space. When electric and magnetic fields are coupled together, propagating as waves, the relationship is like voltage and current. This has units of ohms, and so this is like voltage, that's like current. So if I know the magnitude of E, I instantly know the magnitude of H. When this is oscillating, so is this oscillating, and they are locked together by this relative value here. So um, I write that equation here. Well, it seems I don't have it here. So um, the magnitude of E then is equal to nada, and it'll be the magnitude of H. So even if I'm not in vacuum, I've got a kind of Ohm's law relationship for free space. Okay, and I can put in 377 ohms, or I could correct for nada using this value here. I, I still will write the full nada out in a minute. Um, yes? Uh, is the measure on the left is, uh, is that mu or m? Where, uh, yeah, yeah. This? Mu. Oh. Yeah. The permit, permeability, you know, from ECE 110, okay, for magnetic effects, right? Um, I'm just assuming you've seen this several times in your courses already. Okay, so uh, where's that equation I want? Okay, so this is useful idea because now I don't need to follow H in all of electro electromagnetic theory. If I know E, I can quickly construct H. How do I get H? 
Well, I divide the impedance into E, and I know the magnitude of H. Then I just need to know where does it point. Where does it point? I need to make E cross H point in the power flow direction. So if I know, if I know power is there, E is there, where is H? I think, I think that's wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> which hand? Yeah. Which hand? I think I just did that wrong. E cross. No, I got that backwards. So I have to do E cross H points this way. So I have E this way. H is pointing down. Okay. So here E cross H points like that. If I put E up. H is there, that right hand rule gets me into the energy flow direction, okay? So I can always find, if I have a right hand that works, okay? <laughs> I can always find the direction of H and I can get the magnitude from, from this value of vacuum space or the material space. So the last little thing to do is to think about the speed of light. One of the really amazing insights when Einstein was assembling Faraday's laws and, and putting together the background physics, trying to fix up a couple missing things, is he found that a wave equation appeared before him. And the wave equation had a velocity which turns out to be 1 over mu not epsilon. And that's really amazing that magnetic effects and um, so capacitor and inductor effects, this is inductor capacitor physics, right? That the combination of those ting things, those numbers were known from capacitors and inductors. When he calculated that, this turned out to be equal to the speed of light over the root of epsilon r. So right, I, in here I put epsilon r, epsilon naught. So it became the speed of light, and then suddenly people went, well, light must be an electromagnetic wave. Wow, we never knew that before. And, and so the whole idea of the electromagnetic spectrum started to be constructed together in, in people's minds at that time. It's a very powerful um, realization at, at the time that really opened up a lot of ideas. So if we keep carrying this forward, notice that this is equal to C over N because of the definitions I had here. The square root of epsilon R is just the refractive index. So these are the connecting ideas to the wave theory that we will use occasionally here. So for example, if I'm in um, glass, then what is nada in glass? Glass has a refractive index of about 1.5. Okay, So I need to make this about 1.5 higher impedance. Okay, uh, Sorry, 1.5 less impedance, excuse me. So I have to put in epsilon r in here to correct it, and I divide by 1.5. Epsilon naught then will be how much bigger? How much will epsilon be bigger? It'll be 1.5 squared bigger. Okay, 3 halves squared bigger. So that's basically how it works. Okay, so in the optical domain, then we follow electric field. Pretty much in most of the electromagnetic spectrum, we tend to follow this, spend less of the time on H for the reasons I just presented. This is not novel just to the optical domain. Okay, so any questions on these basic parameters? We can now put H kind of under the rug and follow E. Okay, the second thing to do is to look at the pointing vector. Kind of interesting that this name rhymes with pointing. It sounds the same as pointing. That is the direction. And the pointing vector points in the energy flow direction. So it's a really neat thing. And it's related to power flux. which is power per area. OK, so let's define the pointing vector up here. S is the symbol. It's defined to be E cross H. So these are the instant values of E and H. And E and H quite often is in phase, except in lossy materials. Um, so this would tell me the instantaneous power flow. Now, the reality is, in, in, as the discussion yesterday, or last lecture, 
Um, we talked about how fast the field is oscillating. So we don't have circuits that can follow the electromagnetic waves in the optical domain instantaneously. So light energy is absorbed a photon at a time. And what happens then is we are measuring the average of power flow. And so we can then take the time average of these quantities. OK, so this is just going to be S average, okay, time average. And that will then be taking E cross H time average. Now remember, we did this time, um, time averaging of quantities little a and b at our last lecture. And so that allowed us to rewrite this as 1 half times the real part of E. Now we have to modify it to a cross product, but we take the complex conjugate of H against E. OK, so using that result from the last lecture, all we need is some way to get H and E together. They're two different parameters, but I can now use these ideas here to replace H with E. Use this vector quantity here, in fact, to get it exactly right. So let's um, take advantage of, of that quantity. So H is equal to K cross um, the electric field. And I have to divide then by this mu naught um, impedance term. So let's work this out further. It's 1 half, 1 over the impedance of the vacuum. And I'm going to be taking the real part of E crossed with H which is now k star cross e star. So we would take this product first. So, so, so now we can um, keep playing with this. k star, it's not a complex number. It just equals k, right? So it's a real valued quantity. So the star on there has no effect, but h, um, star going to E star, this will have a dependence because in phasor form we would change the sign of the phasors when we do the time averaging. So that could be um, a significant quantity. So let's now try to go forward, but I've got three vectors in here, and then but two of them are the same. So there might be some kind of simplification I can find in this. So if you will recall this identity, if you take A cross B cross C, then you create a vector which tries to go perpendicular to A. So it, it, the result is um, a vector which is in the B and C directions. And the amplitudes then depend on, on, depend on dot products. So you have a B component that depends on A dot C. Okay? And you have a C component that depends on the dot product of A with B. All right, so that's something that I believe you would have seen before. And we just impose that here, take advantage of that here. So I'll go to the next. Well, maybe I can do one more line here. So let's continue calculating the average value of s, the pointing vector. So it's now going to be equal to 1 half nada and the real part of these phasor terms. So expanding all of this, I have. Um, the first E is A, OK? So the, so the B term is K. So I have K as a direction. And then I have um, E is the, is the A term, and C is the E star term. And I take the dot products, and I go, well, that looks interesting. E dotted with its complex conjugate, that turns into a real number. and. The next term, C, is E star. And then I'm taking A, which is E, dotted with K. Oh, wrong symbol. OK. So looks like there's a bit of math here, but I can actually simplify this. Are you going to simplify it, or are you going to ask a question? I don't have it upside down. That is indeed true. So let's put one over this. Thank you very much. So, good. I have a question for the uh, case. Star? Yeah, equal to K. Why is that? Um, what is K? Is, uh, 
right? So it's 2 pi over the wavelength. That's the magnitude. And then it's just a vector I could put in the z direction. So there's nothing to star there. There's no imaginary part. OK? That's, I got it. All right. OK. It's a real valued quantity. OK. Good question. Probably lots of other people had the same one. Yes. Oh, yes. The difference between this and k? Because k itself is a vector, right? This is not a vector. That's the magnitude of k. Yeah, but that one with the yeah. Isn't it a vector? It's a vector, yeah. Yeah, so if you divide it by its amplitude, yeah. it's a direction. Right. So does it still have? That's this. Uh, sorry, this here. Um, did I make a mistake? That's great. Sorry. This is what you're asking about. Is that right? Yes. So k hat is a direction. So why don't you just put k, k because vector No, because then I have 2 pi over wavelength, and I'm oh, distorting okay. the value. So you just mean k, k divided by 2 pi over wavelength. That's what this is, yeah. yeah. That's the direction of power flow. It's not 2 pi over wavelength. It's just convenient that I know that that's the, the there's the wave front, that's the propagation direction k. And so I make it a unit vector now. OK? Mm -hmm. So does k, does k error, the vector k, always have one direction, single direction, or is it, it can have a lot um, of Well, interference, we could have k1 up here, k2 down there, and make interference of waves. but. K1 is perpendicular to this wavefront. The magnitude is always 2 pi over, over wavefront. Right. right. So you have to distribute evenly and to make uh, x and y squared plus y squared plus z squared equal to kx squared plus ky squared. The, the components of k and x and y and z add up in Pythagorean theorem in 3D. OK? okay. But, the, but the amplitude of this vector is still constant, right? So it's like pointing. Yes, okay. yes. As long as there's a single wavelength present. Okay. I can make things more complicated, so I've been simplifying them here. Yeah. Okay, good. All right, so that, I hope that's helpful for everyone. Good. You have a question? I have a question for the spatial frequency. And every time you don't have, if you write that into a vector form, you always say it's pointing to the z direction. Why is it always pointing to the z direction? Um, I'm simplifying a direction, so I'm giving you something to visualize. And then I can ask, well, if k is there, which way does e and h point? Oh, okay. Then, you know, then you should be able to twist this around. But if I keep jumping randomly around, you're going to get lost more easily, I think. Okay. OK? So we tend to think of, a lot of times I'll just propagate in z, and we ask what happens in the x and y plane. That's, that's what we're going to do next in polarization. No one's been able to simplify my equation here yet. Yes? Right, so k is perpendicular to e. So I take note up here that k is the propagation direction, is perpendicular to e, so this direction is 0. OK? Thank you. All right, and so what I'm left with then is the magnitude, the average of a, of the pointing vector, then turns out to be. Um, I'll write it two ways. One half, one over eta, and this becomes the electric field magnitude squared because the complex conjugate part uh, is gone. And what is the propagation direction? Uh, sorry, it's. Um, well, I made a mistake here. Uh, sorry, I. Is this why you're asking this question? This arrow is k hat. <laughs> That's k hat there. OK? So it's not, I'm not, I shouldn't be throwing 2 pi over lambda in there. Yes. OK, and these are all k hats. 
Okay, so please catch them there, there, there. Okay. So I wasn't thinking there, so I'm using that result. Okay, so there's the direction only. S and K um, hat are parallel. So I could say K hat or K are parallel. Okay, that's one interesting thing. And then we're, we don't need to think about magnetic field. Electric field squared magnitude works. And notice I can replace this data if I go back um, to comparing this with the vacuum result. The only difference between these two is um, root epsilon r. So I can put a refractive index in, and this becomes 1 half n over the vacuum value, okay, times the electric field magnitude squared and in the k hat direction. Okay. So these are the two forms here. So now, if I know the electric field strength, say volts per centimeter, I just plug it in. I put in 377 ohms. If I'm in glass, I write um, N in there, and then I can see how much power flow is, um, is going through my material. Question? Uh, did I? If I take um, E has, um, let me let me just check so I don't make an error. So if we go back, we had E is equal to a, a maximum amplitude, and it's modulated by E to the I omega t minus k dot r. Okay. So um, I'm, I, I should, it's good to ask that question. Um, you need to get this to see why I get the amplitude. So remember, this, this is a value that's changing with time and space. It has a direction, but it's going down. It's sometimes zero. E is the maximum value it has. And this is what's modulating it as time or space is changing. Yes? Say that one more time. If so the, the epsilon yeah, the, the, the magnitude of E. Right? Yeah. So, but it also it has the vector form. Is it because of the theta? Because it's a theta? Well, there's a vector here. There has to be a vector on the right side. So I, I need to know where it's pointing. So this has volts per meter, the maximum, and I need to know where it points. OK, that covers it. Question. OK, this E, if I'm standing at the Z place at a certain time, this might be capital E. OK, well, well, hold on. So, so now if I turn time on, this, will, uh, this might do that. That's linear polarization. That's this. OK, what is this? That's this. And I turn time on, it doesn't change. Why does it have an L on the top? Because it's pointing up. It's a vector. Yeah, so this is just math, I think. I have this vector. It's 10 volts per centimeter. It doesn't change. And it points like this. Now I turn time on. That takes this vector, makes it smaller, pushes it down, points it up. That's describing this. Yeah, I could put T and R equals 0, and I'm like this. OK, boy, it's, there's, this is very basic stuff. So just the difference between these two. Let's, let's just get it straight, right? This tells me what E really is. If I was here at this time in this space, I would get this value. And it's going to be fluctuating as cosine function. I have to take the real part of this to see what's really happening, OK? But I would like to know what is the maximum value of E, OK? 
So I can put 10 volts per centimeter here, and I can say it points in the y hat direction. But we know it's a wave, so it has to oscillate. This doesn't oscillate. I, I, I will use kz times z. I'll make that the only non-zero component. So the wave propagates that way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm teaching, I've got to teach you polarization. So why don't you hang on, and I probably will answer some of those questions, those, those, cons those mix-up things you have right now. Let me, let me push ahead, because I'm going to introduce polarization in about two minutes. OK? So let's get over this part here because I'm going to come back and spend a lot of time on that, the rest of the lecture. OK, so if I have this as the pointing vector, this is the peak value of electric field. Oh, um, and I take its magnitude, so I don't care what direction it goes in. I square it, and time average gives me a half. Include the impedance to correct for the h term. Include n because it slows down, and put back the direction, I now know how much power I'm going. So what are the, how much power is flowing, but what are the units of this quantity if it's power flux? It's flux, yeah, it's watts per meter squared, okay? And it has a direction. So what if I wanted to measure power? For example, I could have power flow like this, I could put my arms like this and ask how much goes through my arms. I could rotate it, whatever. So I could have an area A and a direction for the area, a vector for that. Okay? So it turns out the power flow then will be equal to S, which is the power per area. And I just integrate it over an area. So I make that a vector. And I would integrate over some kind of closed uh, surface the total area of whatever my detector is. So s dot dA would be the result. OK, and um, this then would be, for example, something like 1 half n over nada, magnitude of E is the curly one squared. And you might write cosine theta d, um, dA if there's an angle between k and a. So this allows for the possibility that I could have dA like that as a vector and power flow k or s, not necessarily orthogonal to that. And so this would be theta here. So I need to project the two together. OK? Yes? So s and s average are the same thing, right? Say that one more time. S? Um, no, this is the instantaneous, uh, sorry, oh, I didn't time average, did I? Yeah, that has to be the average, sorry. I can do it both ways. You're right, thanks. So that should be the average. So yes? The, the number goes to variable average n, so the last should be not a uh, Nate, Nate, oh, eta is not, thank you so much. That's a vacuum. Sorry? Nada Nada naught is 377 ohms. OK. That's 377 ohms always. And this value is refractive index. OK. It's good, good questions, just to keep it all um, clear. OK, now there's a name for the magnitude of S. What do we call that? So in optics, we use the word intensity often, but it's not really properly the right word. It should really be called irradiance. But almost everyone I know in my field calls it intensity. So um, I don't know, it's kind of like staying with old units, like, like um, miles, per, miles instead of kilometers. OK, let's um, think of just a quick, oh, yes, OK. So, uh, what, is, what is after d squared? Um, times cosine theta times d. 
cosine um, and integrate it over A. Okay, so if my loop is 45 degrees relative to the power flow, then the projected area is cosine 45 smaller. So I divide by root 2. Okay, that's all that means. If my detector is like this, the energy doesn't go through the loop. So cos of 90 is 0. Yes? Um, an electric field which has a certain electric field value. Uh, what is the intensity of? If I have uh, 10 volts per centimeter squared oscillating here, it has an electromagnetic wave and the refractive index is 1.5 and it extends over all space, then that's the power flow of that wave. If it's 20 volts per centimeter squared, it's four times more um, power flow. Um, well, I, I wouldn't mix the two units up. It's the intensity of the electromagnetic wave. Then there's the power of the electromagnetic wave. Maybe that's what I need to say. Okay. Got it. Okay. So a quick example. Let's just do it here. This um, laser pointer is just a bit less than, well, it's probably quite weak now, maybe one millivolt, uh, one milliwatt of power. Okay. So as an example, Let's consider something just a little bit more powerful, 10 milliwatts, just above the damage threshold for the eye. So if I use 10 milliwatts and put it in a small beam of an area, so this is power, okay, then if I put it in an area of 0.1 by 0.1 millimeters squared, a little bit smaller than the beam is right now, you can calculate going backwards from these equations, you know, in everything, including the area, making this 1, cos theta 1. You can calculate the electric field, and it turns out to be the magnitude of that electric field um, is, turns out to be 275 volts per centimeter. Okay. So, just a comment, if I have a voltage like that, th that's actually more voltage than you would see in an AC circuit if you put your two fingers in the prongs, right? Because you have 100 volts over maybe 1.5 centimeters. So should I be frightened? Should I turn this on right now? Why, why doesn't that hurt me? <laughs> why doesn't that hurt me? So as electrical engineers, you should have some insight into why this is not so dangerous, but at 60 hertz, it's dangerous. <laughs> I, would not do, I would not stick my finger in the AC circuit, unless you paid me lots of money. <laughs> <laughs> no, the voltage is there. That's the real voltage of this power source. That's how much voltage is there. Go ahead. No. no if it's, this is, and, and it is vacuum. It's 377 ohms. Interference between no. Not, well, not, not really interference, but maybe that gets us the right idea. No. Oh, no. It, it takes time to burn me. So if I put 100 volts over a centimeter, and hold it there for a sixtieth of a second, it's enough time to, to have current that burns me. With this, there's no time to move charges, so it can't do any work on me. I can't build up resistive losses. So the faster a circuit oscillates, the harder it is to break down something or to do damage to materials. Okay? That's the reason. So this is oscillating at ter or petahertz frequencies versus 60 hertz. So if I hold that voltage for longer, yeah, it'll hurt. <laughs> All right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, you could tolerate higher voltage oscillating at higher frequencies. Okay. So DC is really dangerous. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions. Okay, so let's, cause that, that's, that's all I have to say actually on this section. So spent a fair bit of t more time than I intended on something very basic here. Okay, I'm going to talk about polarization next. I'm just curious, how did you measure that voltage? I, cal I calculated it from this. Oh. 
That's an exercise. Everything's given. Power, 10 milliwatts. Area, put the area there. Put in 377 ohms. Put in one for refractive index. Solve for the result. The integral just becomes area times that. Okay, That should be very obvious and easy to do. Okay. All right. So there's a good example, some things to make you think. Okay, I'm going to start dancing a lot here with, I'm going to throw a lot of symbols at you. So this, this is a bit heavy. Um, it's not hard, but it's, it's three, three dimensions. So, you know, if you're good at dancing or have good 3D spatial coordination, you might, you might be able to follow all of this and do, do really well. So you have to pay attention on this kind, on, on this. So what we're going to do is start with electric field. Let me just... Um, introduce the ideas to you first before I run through the equations so you can sort of see why we need a, a few additional terms. Okay, we've tried to simplify a kind of orientation where we have light propagating along the z-axis. So which way does E point? Which way does the electric field point? Which way doesn't it point? It can't point along z, right? Okay, that's easy. So E can point up to you anywhere in this plane as long as it remains 90 degrees around. So how many degrees of freedom do I have for how my electric field can play? What kinds of electric fields can I have in here? I can have linear polarization along the y-axis. I can pick linear polarization along the x-axis at any angle, 45 degrees. So electric field could be doing that. What is H doing while this is happening? If H is, if E is there, where's H? It's there. So I don't know if I can do that, but if E is doing this, then H is doing that, right? Okay? So you got to dance here. <laughs> all right. I didn't do that very well, but, but, but you got to remember H is following E all the time. Okay, now there's other things I could do. I could take E here and E here. If they're in phase, what is that? So let me do it again. If I'm now propagating to you, if E is in phase and equal amplitudes, what is the net result of electric field? Where is it pointing? Vector sum is there. As this retracts, it points nowhere. It's zero, right? And then they do that. And so I end up describing linear polarization at 45 degrees. OK, I'm getting my exercise routine today. OK, so that's linear polarization. Now, what would happen if I do this with electric field along x, and I go, oh, I'm going to be 0. But they're equal. So at this moment in time, this guy's fully extended. This guy is 0. And as I turn time on, I could pull him up and retract here. Then as this retracts, this comes out like that. And then this will go down as this retracts. There's 90 degree phase difference as this is oscillating. So what kind of polarization would that be? It's circular polarization. Because at this moment, I have a maximum amplitude here. This is retracting while this is growing. So the vector actually doesn't change length. The electric field is always on at the same amplitude. And it's rotating this way. Okay. Now, I could make it rotate the other way. So I'm going to have right and left circular polarization to think about where the x and y components are identical. But in phasor form, I have to make the y component out of phase with the x component, either by plus or minus 90 degrees, which would change the rotation. And then there's one, ad well, there's two additional types of polarization. Can you guess what it would be? What would be another one? Sorry? Elliptical? Okay, elliptical. So I have this fully extended. This will be just elbow long, right? And then when this retracts, this only comes up halfway. So now what will happen as I let time completely circle around, I've got an elliptical shape for that component. And I can go and mess things up and rotate the ellipse and have it rotate at any angle I like, okay? So those are the main classes of polarization. There's one more. Okay, it's, it's what the rest of the people are doing today. They're probably in some club with random polarization. They're out clubbing, okay? <laughs> random or unpolarized 
the electric field is jumping randomly around. So that's a less coherent, a non-coherent type of source, unpolarized light. Okay, so, th so those are the basic things we got to know. And I, I think you all could follow those concepts here, but I need to make it mathematical. And so there's a vector notation we're going to develop for this, etc. So there's a large number of equations, and then we'll try to dress these up against each of these examples as we go forward. So I'm thinking maybe we just take a little bit earlier break, not by much, 10 minutes. So we'll start at um, 7 after, and we'll have a bunch of equations, okay? All right.